is very applicable. So we have 86% of consumers are actually willing to pay more for a great client experience. So I want you guys to keep that in mind when, you know, we're talking about pricing in all of these groups, you know, yes, we can talk about, oh, well, here's how much I'm um, going to charge for this YZ service, but think about the experience that you're offering people, because if you really wow them, they're going to, they're going to be willing to pay the amount that, that you are asking for that. Um, also consumers truly believe that like we, we as the service provider should understand and um, be able to meet their needs and expectations. Um, this can kind of be one of those things. I know I've experienced this in my practice. Um, my clients had said to me, we want to hear from you more. We just weren't sure where things were. And I, I was somewhat shocked by that because um, I thought I had done a, a pretty good job at keeping them um, com communicating throughout our engagement. But they said, no, you know, we just, we want, we want to know more, but it was assumed that I knew that. So um, they do believe that we just understand everything that they need um, as it relates to their expectations. Also, it says that um, more recently, and this is probably due to some of the uh, things that have now changed due to COVID, um, consumers actually believe that their standard of um, client experience is much higher than it's been in the past. So that's a, a pretty significant thing to be mindful of. And um, obviously, 79% of millennials, which is the population coming into their careers here and are the ones that are making money that are going to be, you know, taxpayers for many, many years now, um, they're more likely to make purchases from businesses with a mobile customer service portal. Uh, that is one of the benefits about Taxome. It is a fully functional app. So once they download the app on their phone and they connect it, they almost never have to log back into the system on desktop. So it's great that Taxome offers that. So Let's kind of go into a quick little exercise for how your client should feel. This should be very, very quick, but I want you to choose three words. Oh, excuse me. Let's go back. I want you to choose three words for what you want your clients to feel. Um, a lot of the times I see people say they want their clients to feel informed, educated, supported. Um, and I want you guys to, by all means, you're welcome to put this in the chat, but I want you to think about this because that defines a lot for how you're going to set up your engagement with your taxpayers um, so that they feel all those things that you want them to feel when it comes to working with you. So think about those three words. If you guys want to put them in the chat just to give every, everybody some ideas, feel free to do that. So a little bit about kind of our profitable and peaceful practice model. So a lot of you guys might find yourself in these different cycles of your practice. So the first one is this, I would consider this highly manual, um, disorganized, high client focus is actually probably the, the status quo for most firms. Um, their clients probably really love them, but there's so much that goes on in the background that maybe they're not aware of from a disorganizational level. Um, so it, it, it's, it's where most people are. We call it the status quo practice. Um, when you get down here where we have someone who is not only highly manual and disorganized, but now they have a really low client focus, this is what we've referred to as a withering practice. These clients are leaving them because they just cannot get their stuff together. Um, so we find the people who have you know, very manual processes and don't have any organization in their practice, they're going to see that their practices are dwindling. Are you guys not seeing, um, you guys don't see anything. Oh, the screen's on, okay, excuse me. Um, so the next, what we have here is what we refer to as our idle practice. So this is a practice probably where a lot of you guys might start out simply because you are learning about how we need to improve our client focus. So this is a practice that is starting to embrace automation. So they're naturally going to feel and present to be more organized to their clients, but it's still very much low client focus. So this is, you know, this is not going to scale. If you don't change the focus to your clients and make them feel like you guys educated, empowered, you guys are giving really, really good examples of how you want your clients to feel. We need to take these two things and switch this over to what we refer to as our prosperous practice, which is automated, highly organized and high client focus. So this is where we want you guys. Um, it is the corner of profitable and peaceful. You have a automated practice, you're organized. So you're, you're efficient and you're saving time. And a lot of the focus is on how your clients feel. Um, this is how you scale. 
you scale by by meeting meeting the corner here of profitable and peaceful. So let's talk a little bit about what automation is and how do we use it. So automation is the creation and application of technology used to monitor and control the production and delivery of products and services while minimizing human involvement. You've probably heard all this before, you know, computers are gonna replace accountants. Not true, but we can definitely replace elements of manual processes in our firms with automation. So let's go over a couple of examples of automation that you guys probably are already experiencing. And, um, you know, automation is not something new. Um, although it has become more of a buzzword when people are talking about, you know, automating your practices, automate your tasks, relieve yourself of admin stuff. Um, but, but really automation has been around for a long, long time and we experience it all day, every day. So our motion detecting lights, you walk into a room, a motion detector realizes you're there and it turns a light on. It was not required for you to turn the switch to turn the light on. Automatic transmission vehicles. Also, we have automatic shut off on our electronic devices. Those of you who love your flat irons and your curling irons, if it were not for the auto sh automatic shut off, how many of you would burn your houses down? My hand is raised. <laughs> Also, um, some of the marketing emails that we receive, um, yes, there is the manual creation of those emails, but still we are able to schedule those and have those triggered at a time where a computer tells us this is the best time for your audience to receive XYZ message. So there's a lot of automation that we're already experiencing every day. So let's briefly go over how we start the automating process, because I understand the demo is probably going to be more beneficial for you guys to really see it in process. I have um, an example client set up where I will show you guys um, both the client and practitioner side and just to give you an idea of what we can do. So hopefully I will touch each of these points. So here are some things that uh, we can automate that we are able to utilize uh, automating here in Techstone. You can automate your emails. So Automating emails is really more than just sending a message. This is going to allow you to send the right message at the right time in front of the right people without the manual having to remember to send those things. So every marketing email that you guys get, that person who has arranged those automations to trigger has done that with um, significant intention to make sure it gets to when is the best time you're likely to open it and with hopefully a message that is going to get you involved and engaged with their product or service. So invoicing, automated invoicing, it allows you to process payments without having to worry about maintaining AR or issuing a receipt. I love the automating of invoices. Many of you guys uh, understand being in this industry, we have to keep receipts. Um, I don't have to dig for them anymore. Um, I, I pay for a service and then because I pay, the um, invoice uh, receipt is automatically sent to me. Um, you'll also find that automating your invoices is going to significantly minimize the errors and it's going to speed up the way your clients pay you. Studies say 90% faster. So this is pretty significant. So if you are not already automating your invoicing, I highly recommend that you make that one of your focuses. Let's talk briefly about e-signatures. Those of us who need to collect e-signatures in order for us to get e-file authorizations from our clients or just other signatures such as our um, engagement letters that we need to have signed. So signature automation, it makes use of e-signatures and digital signatures to approve and validate documents. So instead of putting pen to paper, your e-signatures allow you to legally bind and digitally stamp on um, legal documents. So uh, signatures that are done electronically, they are in fact legally binding. Um, Adobe has a really good explanation for the law that is behind that. I don't have it um, with me at the moment, but they do have a really good explanation as to how uh, electronic signatures have become um, kind of the standard, standard uh, status quo and they, they're legally binding. So anyone who says, oh, but I can physically sign it, um, might, might fall onto their sword here because it is now legally binding. Um, one of my favorite things that Taxdome does has to do with task management. So um, by automating this process, you're going to minimize the handling of simple tasks or a series of more complex ones. Um, so this is going to also reduce errors and um, increase your efficiency. So when we think about our processes, think about the things that you do that are exactly the same every single day for every single client. We know that if we're going to take a tax prep client we have our intake, we have an organizer, they sign a contract, they pay an invoice, right? Like that process is pretty much identical for every single client. So the more that we're capable of automating that like task 
uh, management uh, process, it's going to reduce errors because you're going to be doing the same thing every single time. It's going to be your guide to say every single time, A, B, C, D, and they'll all be, um, there'll be a record of what you've completed. And then my uh, next favorite uh, process in Taxdome has to do with the automation of collecting documents. So um, obviously we can't see a raise of hands right now, but I'm going to assume that everybody at some point has had difficulty getting a form or a document from a taxpayer that you need to prepare their tax return. So Taxdome comes in and makes it incredibly easy where the taxpayer can scan a document using the client app, which has a integrated scan function. So they can take high quality scanned document copies to send to you through the app. So they don't even have to log onto their computer. Um, it, it minimizes the amount of time the taxpayer spends doing these things that just annoy them. So um, I do love Taxdome for the fact that it allows easy and efficient document collecting. Okay, so I'm going to go over a couple examples, um, which will later play into uh, our demo here. So um, email automa automation is fantastic. And um, some examples for how, you know, we recommend that you use it in your practice. You can send a thank you meeting, excuse me, a thank you email to a client after a meeting has concluded. Um, for those of you who have ever met with a service provider, and let's say 30 minutes after the meeting has ended, you get an email, it was so wonderful to meet you, I'm going to do XYZ. Um, that, that's a really, really great feeling. Even though we might know that it's an automatic trigger, it still feels good to have the acknowledgement um, to be thanked for, for showing up. So I love um, the thank you emails after meeting has concluded. We can also send an email to confirm that you've received documents from your clients. This was a step I added to my tax workflow this year, simply because my taxpayers were sending stuff in, but they didn't know whether or not the documents had been received by my by my team, you know, they could see them in the portal, but there wasn't an acknowledgement on their end. Hey, we got your documents, we're gonna review them. So I added this to my tax prep workflow this year and it was wonderful. It really minimized the number of emails I got from clients asking me, hey, what's up? Where am I in the process? Um, another fantastic email autom automation is sending instructional emails to your clients of what to expect. So the next steps. Um, things like onboarding instructions, or even here's what I need you to do for us to set up your S corporation. All of those instructional emails are super easy to automate um, and your clients find those instructional emails incredibly beneficial. They can refer to that later, um, but it's very easy and you don't have to remember manually to send um, an instructional email in your workflow. And then, um, you know, as I kind of mentioned before, uh, status emails. I have in my tax prep workflow status emails pretty much throughout the entire process. So the taxpayer is fully informed of where they are every single step of the way. This cuts back on dozens, dozens of emails I would probably get from people just wanting to know where things were. So I really love status emails in Taxdome. Okay, so let's get into invoice automation. There's a couple different ways that I utilize this in um, Taxdome. But um, some of my favorite things are you can collect a deposit or retainer payment automatically. I'm gonna give you guys an example of what that looks like in my process here. You can create recurring payments. So um, being able to uh, put the client on an automatic draft of their credit card or bank account to facilitate some kind of monthly engagement is always amazing when it comes to the automation capabilities. Um, you can also collect payment um, prior to the release of completed work. One of the most powerful functions in Taxdome is that feature. So if any of you are um, are in a, a situation where you know, you've sent the taxpayer completed work and they owe you money and they haven't paid you, you know the likelihood of getting payment for that work is very, very small. So um, now within Taxdome, the taxpayer will have to pay an invoice before they can even see a document. Um, I use this a lot in my final process when I'm sending the final invoice and all the signature documents because um, it is required that if you get an 8879 signed by your taxpayer, you are required to file that tax return within three days. It does not matter if they paid you or not. Um, otherwise, you as the ERO will be um, stockpiling your uh, e-file and that's a big no-no. So you do want to be mindful of making sure you get payment prior to releasing completed work. 
And then also you can securely store your client's payment information. Um, those of you who are aware of the requirements for you know, the PCI compliant type platforms, um, you know, TaxDome and their providers, which they sync with um, Stripe and CPA charge, they both have a very powerful but encrypted back end that allows you to store that information. So later down the line, if the taxpayer says, oh, I need to pay XYZ invoice, you can say, I have XYZ card on file. Would you like me to charge that? And you can accommodate that. So we have a question real quick. So Faith is asking um, if I'm selling the email templates. Um, I am working with someone to possibly sell the email templates. Um, for now, they're very kind of basic. Hey, your tax return has been filed. Um, and if I'm being honest, the way that I talk to my clients might not be the way that other people do. I'm very casual, um, full transparency. When I file my taxpayers' um, returns, it says, bibbity bobbity boo <laughs> like that's the real email but they love it because they don't expect their tax practitioner to you know be kind of funny or have a sense of humor and so they, they do enjoy the um the more casual um the more casual stuff i if i had an entire conversation with someone faith on this yesterday so it is very much um something i am considering <laughs> All right, so next we're going to briefly touch on e-signature automation. You can request, track, and process e-signatures on your contracts. This is amazing when you are trying to send engagement letters or contracts to taxpayers, um, you know, in mass. You can send contracts to a thousand people all at once um, at the click of a button. And so it's very great if you are trying to get all those contracts out without really having to think much about it. Um, and then similarly, uh, TaxDome has the option to use KVA authentication. Um, it is $1 per signature per document. So if you have a document with multiple signatures for the same person, it's just the $1. If you have a document with multiple signatures for two separate people, it would be $2 but the number of signatures for that one individual on the same document um, will not be an additional charge. So hopefully that clarifies how KB works, but they have that available. And uh, briefly we'll cover task automation. So as I mentioned, um, standardized, creating standardized processes. This is huge. Um, if you really do want to have automations just do the most for you, you are going to have to look at your processes and you're going to, have to see where there are redundancies. Um, if there are things that you do the same every single time, it is very likely that you have some kind of standard operating procedure in your head that you can now put to paper and put it in a system like TaxDome. So now you can potentially delegate those tasks to someone else. We wanna get these tasks out of our head and down to either pen and paper and then into some kind of electronic task management tool. So TaxDome does that really well. So you you can easily assign and notify a staff member of new tasks. Um, I have a very small team, but um, if I need to assign a task to my team member, it's very easy. I create it, send it to her, um, and she understands you know what, what she needs to do. Um, so it does ease that collaboration kind of like among your staff. Um, I do also have a virtual assistant who does, you know, a whole separate set of tasks from my um, full-time assistant. So being able to facilitate tasks that go out to both of them and have, you know, the things I need done has been extremely helpful. Um, my efficiency is definitely up, but it also takes guesswork out of like your work in process. And so when I go over the demo, I'll further explain what that looks like. But a lot of how TaxDome is great is it allows you to see where things are throughout the entire process of, um, of your workflow. So, um, and finally, we're going to review briefly our document automation. So we can create a lead qualifying application. There was a question in the group earlier about this. So TaxDome has the ability that when a taxpayer um, does the self sign up for, uh, self sign up option um, you just have to have that enabled you can select for that new account sign up to drop into a workflow and trigger a handful of automations so for my lead workflow which i'm going to demonstrate for you guys um, when a taxpayer signs on they select which option they want to um, move forward with um, in this case i'm going to show you my strategy workflow and they get an application that is strictly related to the application for services for strategy i have another one for resolution and I have a different question that says, I need help with the tax problem. So click of a button and the whole workflow starts. So it gets them into some kind of lead 
qualifying lead management um, tool. So that is another fantastic thing you can do in Taxstone. Excuse me, you can also create templates for contracts and disclosures. So um, I, I don't have in the workflow that I'm gonna show you today, a example of a kind of disclosure. I will show you guys the actual template um, after I conclude the demo. Um, I do have a template that I think is incredibly helpful and a really good example for how we can get clients involved in our engagement and keep them like abreast of like all the things that they need to know by utilizing a kind of contract environment and having them agree to that. So I do love that as well. And then of course you can also share your soft with your, with your staff just at various stages in your workflow. Taxstone uses a function that they refer to as their wiki, which can be used to kind of hold all of your standard operating procedures and you can create dozens. Um, and then you can have a workflow where at certain points in the workflow, those instructions are then applied to the, um, the account. So whomever is looking at that process, um, they're able to see at that point in time um, what they need to do. This can be custom for, for clients. If you happen to have a smaller book of clients and maybe you have a really, really big VIP client who gets like super special treatment, you could have a wholly separate wiki that is applied for that client specifically. So every tax every staff member that goes into that client workflow will see, oh my gosh, this person needs to have white glove service. They don't respond to phone calls. They have, you have to text message their assistant. I do have clients like that. Um, so very, very helpful in the ability to share that information. So um, I'm glad you, glad I got the chance to show you something new, Chastity. Um, okay. So this is the conclusion of the presentation. I have just two more slides briefly to just share some information with you guys before I move on to the demo. Um, but uh, for those of you who um, are unaware of um, you know, what our program kind of involves, so um, our program is uh, intended to you know, get tax domes that, to get you involved in the setup of tax dome. We do not offer done view services. Um, what we have discovered that uh, while that is a need for some people, it doesn't, um, it doesn't offer the same understanding of how the program works. So it turned into longer engagements where support was needed. If something broke during the tax season, it was very difficult for the people who had it done for them to know where things broke and to fix it. So it made sense for us to work with, um, with uh, smaller firms and smaller teams in order to you know, make sure they understand the system and also just get things running smoothly. So a huge benefit is um, you know, yes, you get access to the course modules, but we have a very, very comprehensive template pipeline bank. Um, it, it has all the elements. So when I refer to a pipeline, which I'll explain further, um, the pipeline has multiple different stages and elements that make up the entire workflow itself. And those are all included in our templates. Um, we also have just lots of support every single week. Um, our Facebook group is very, very active. A lot of people are um, really on top of getting all that information answered. And then also, um, it, it's really a membership. Uh, we do allow for um, 12 month access to the group um, with your program instruction. And then after that, you are um, able to renew for another 12 months at a reduced rate. We have a very high um, resubscription rate because the support that people get is fantastic. We do go and um, introduce new features and tell you how to implement them and sometimes when not to implement them. So um, lots of stuff that you can get in our group. And um, those of you who are not current tax stone users, um, I invite you to um, check out on our website. So if you go to uh, workflowsfortaxpros.com, we have an option where it indicates tax stone. And if you click that link, you can um, subscribe to receive two months of free service. Um, the free service is what is going to be available at your annual renewal. So when you um, apply for tax stone, you're gonna get you know, a two week free trial. You will then sign up for your annual plan. And then next year, when the annual renewal is due, your um, two months free service are added. So then your renewal date is basically pushed back two months. So it's great. It is an exclusive offer for our program. Everyone else will get you just one month. We can get you two. So um, I implore you guys all to check out our website. Hopefully, um, I didn't go too fast. I have a tendency to do that. But I really wanted to get you um, a chance to see the demo. So um, Maria is asking, I'm sorry, Mara, excuse me. Um, she's asking if it's yearly or monthly. It is, is annually. Um, they require the um, first user to always have an annual subscription. After that, you have the option to add um, additional staff members monthly 
for $75 per month. Um, or if you pay for them annually, it drops down to that $50 per month average. So um, still very, very inexpensive for, for what it does. And I'm, I'm excited to show you guys what this does. So give me a quick moment to exit this. I'm gonna move this over here. All right, I've got a handful of things, guys, and I'm gonna try and get in front of you guys. So we're gonna go here and then I'm going to see if I can get this one in here too. I might have to get a different, I might have to pop that in. I'll have to figure out how to do that. Hang on just a minute, guys. I'll just, I'll pop back and forth. Okay, so um, I'm showing you guys an example here of a um, test workflow that I put together, or this is my, my test client. So this is the workflow for my um, strategy leads. Now, I want to kind of break down um, the, the basis behind what Taxdome is and how pipelines and all these things work together. So um, in our group, we use an analogy where we refer to our pipelines. So the pipeline is this whole thing, okay? All of these stages make up your pipeline. Your pipeline is your freeway, okay? So your freeway takes you from point A to point B, point A being something new occurs, a new client, new lead, a new um, tax prep engagement, and then it ends with the conclusion of that service. So that's, those are the two points that we need to get to. Um, so within our pipeline are various stages. Um, your stages are the stops that you make in order to get from point A to point B. So they're very important. You have to make these stops in order to complete that service. Now, the other elements that I'm going to explain to you are, for one, is um, we refer to jobs. This little guy here, this is the job or the job card. So when a job is added to your pipeline, um, it's the car and the car kind of drives among all of these little stages, right? Makes all the stops, but the car doesn't drive without fuel. That is where the automations come in. And Taxstone has a handful of automations that um, are the fuel to this car. And when an action is completed, either internally by the firm or by the client, the car moves and then new things are triggered. So because of the way that I have this set up, let me see if I can get this. I gotta make adjustments on my computer. Give me a second, guys. Work. There we go. And then I can pull this here. One minute, guys. I'm gonna put this back. I have some weird setting on my computer. Okay, great. So, as I am going to demonstrate, I'm gonna go back and forth between what the client sees and then what the practitioner sees. So, mouse turn on. There we go. So, here's the practitioner view. I've added this job card to Taxdome, to my pipeline. Now I need to drive it all the way through this whole process. We're probably not gonna get through the whole thing, but I'm going to do my best to run through some of these different points here. So when I add this job, two things happen. An application is applied here. We've got an organizer that is labeled application for service. And then the taxpayer gets a message or the lead, excuse me. So. The emails look like this. Um, you know, it says Tax Heavy Jessica is asking that you log in and um, complete the organizer so they can click here if they want to get to the organizer directly. And also, it'll say that, you know, Jessica sent you a message. Like, let's go to the chat and see what she says. So if we go to the client view, this is now what the client is going to see. They're going to see a couple of to do's. They have got the application and they've got this message. So the message functions very much like a uh, messenger on your phone, um, uh, you know, letting the taxpayer know or this lead, hey, I'm really excited to work with you. Um, you know, here's what you need to do in order for us to get started. Um, and then letting them know that once it's confirmed, you know, once it's reviewed, then, you know, I'll let you know what the next steps are. So the message is read. Now I have to go and complete this organizer. Um, this has a handful of questions that I ask, um, ask my potential clients just to see if we're a good fit. Um, if you guys are not um, currently doing this, I recommend it. It's really important that you have um, 
a qualification process for your clients. You don't want to take everybody. Um, you definitely want to make sure these people are even just personality right, personality wise, a good fit for you. Um, now this has a handful of questions for the purposes of this demo. I'm going to submit it on the practitioner side. But if I go back here, I can click here on my job card and I've got all of the history of everything. I've applied a due date. I want my leads to be closed within seven days. So I've got the priority as urgent. So this is how it's going to appear on my task list based on the due date and urgency. Um, here, I've got the elements that have taken place. So I know the taxpayer has received a message and then I know they've received an organizer. Um, I am just going to submit this on their behalf just to trigger the automation. So as a practitioner, you are able to submit an organizer on behalf of your taxpayer um, without it being completed. If you have items that are required, um, you as a practitioner can kind of override this, but the client cannot. But I'm going to submit this. Um, it's going to warn me that there are um, unmarked items, but I want to get it submitted because that is now going to um, change a couple things for us. So I'm going to refresh this screen for you here. So now everything, oops, sorry guys. Get my filter back. Thankfully, these are all leads and not clients. All right. I don't know why I can't fix that. All right, putting this back here. All right. So now we have our test account has now moved to this next stage. And the stage tells me that the application has been received and um, that I need to now uh, accomplish a couple of things to move them to the next spot. So I've got three little triggers here. A task has been created. I'm asked to include a task for whether or not this lead is approved or not approved. And then the client receives an email. So they've completed the organizer. If we go here, and I refresh my test email here. Here's what the email looks like. Now, Talkstone works by um, syncing with your email service provider. So I have my fancy little signature here. Um, this is completely automated, but it appears as if I sent it. So I love that Talkstone allows us to use dynamic um, uh, signatures. If so, uh, this is why stamp. It's great. You can, you can embed that. And they're really, really fancy. But this looks like I sent it. I know this is a little bug. They've changed something recently. So we've got a little bug report there. But let's go now to those other items. I'm going to click on this again. Again, all the history is here. So I can tell we have an organizer, a message, and now I have two tasks. So the first one is re review the application. I would go in. I'd see the information that they provide. And I say, this is, this is a good fit. So I'm going to act as if this person was in fact a good fit. So I'm going to complete this review application. And then I have this other tag. This one says to either add the tag approved or not approved. I'm going to click here. And this is where um, another way to tax don't really shines. Tax don't uses conditional logic. The conditional logic works by um, confirming whether or not an account meets certain criteria, typically a tag or set of tags for certain um, automations to trigger based off those criteria. So um, in my lead workflow, um, by using the approved tag, now when I move forward, this taxpayer is going to, or this lead, I should say, they're now only going to receive emails and uh, the like related to that approved message. If they're not approved, they get a denial email. So without having to do much more than simply um, uh, add a tag here, I'm able to now completely change the message that this taxpayer is going to get. So I'm going to mark completed. So we're going to go back. And so now it's moved automatically here. So because this taxpayer was in fact approved, I want to give you guys a little insight how the conditional logic works. This is six potential triggers, not six things that triggered. So in the event that I had the tag not approved, the tax, the lead would get a, we're not a good fit. Sorry. Um, here's a potential referral if you need it. Um, in this case, they were approved. So they're going to get an email that uh, requests that they set up their appointment. And then I have two possibilities here for um, tasks. I have one, if they're not approved to archive the account. And then I have a task to just confirm the appointment simply because Taxstone doesn't yet have a um, perfectly integrated calendar, which is no big deal for me. But then we have an account tag is just updated. So when I'm you know, searching through really quickly, I can see where that person might be. Um, and then we also have um, some possibilities if there's another, um, 
another discovery type. So now um, I just want to give you some insight to what it looks like for the taxpayer. Yes, yeah, so um, absolutely, it does take a, some time to build this. The Probably the biggest benefit, and I know I have some of you guys in my program, the biggest benefit to our program is all of this work that I'm showing you guys is what I've built. So you're literally taking all of my production time and hours in making sure all these run smoothly and everything tests to be perfect. And you're getting it in like this perfect little package where you just have to make some edits as it relates to how you speak to your clients and the time it takes to um, install the workflows that I create. Um, it, it cuts it down from, mind you, some of these workflows take me weeks to develop. You can install them in an hour, sometimes two hours, especially if you're just really familiar with the building process. Um, but th that's a huge, huge benefit to our program. So not to just keep promoting myself, but everything you guys are seeing, you get in our program. They're included in our templates. I develop new workflows all the time. Um, and I, I go through the process of testing them and making sure that they work before we give them to you guys. Okay, so another example, this is what the approved message is going to get. Um, they're just letting them know I want them to book their discovery call. Um, nothing's gonna appear on the client portal because they um, there's, there's no client portal related stuff. They just get that appointment request. I am going to mark here. We've got my new task. It's saying to confirm the appointment has been made. I'm going to say, yes, the appointment's been made. So now it's complete. They've set the appointment. Great. Now I have that the appointment is confirmed. So a couple more triggers, right? I'm going to complete my um, discovery process and I'm going to conclude the appointment. And at the conclusion of the appointment, I'm going to ask them, do you want me to send you a proposal? They're going to say yes or no. If they're going to say no, then we're going to go to the same process, approved, not approved. Because here I removed the approved tag. So there's a, not the likelihood now of being um, potentially mistakenly approved when they were not. So we've removed the tag, but I have kind of the, the same thing. The tax discovery is com uh, complete and I'm going to do this approval. So let's go back to my tags. Our discovery is complete. And I'm gonna add a new tag here. Now we're reapproving them because now they've gone through the discovery process and they do want a proposal now. So we're going to- No idea what she's doing. Add a tag. Okay, so now they're re they're reapproved, different approval process. Okay, I'm gonna go back here and I'm just gonna mark that task complete. They have now been reapproved. And now they move here. This is, guys, this works in the background. I literally do hardly anything aside from you button, a few button clicks. Um, in this stage, we have um, either the discovery has been complete, so they're approved. They now get an email that says, I'm really excited, excuse me, I'm excited to work with you. I'm working on your proposal, keep an eye out for it. Um, you know, based on our, on our conversation, you know, here's what we've just, what we've determined is a good fit for you. So next, and I literally, guys, I literally did these additional um, uh, tasks like an hour before I got in this presentation because I really wanted to show you guys some cool ways to use TaxDome to be able to facilitate proposals if you are able to standardize some of your processes. So I'm going to go in here. We're going to click on our lead here. We've got a couple tasks. We need to add the tag payment plan or pay in full. And then we need to add the tag, um, you know, based off the package that we've discussed they're, they're gonna go through. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to include the strategy tag and the um, payment tag. So I go here, I'm going to do strategy and payment plan. Those are good. We have marked off those two tags. They are complete. And now the taxpayer has been sent their proposal. Um, so they will have been given a message and then we've got some tags that are updated. So I standardized this for you guys um, just before I got here. So I'm gonna refresh this. So this is new. Um, it's a new workflow that I'm testing. So what it has is, you know, I'm letting the taxpayer know, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to working with them. And here's a proposal that I pre prepared for them. 
I want to be completely transparent with you guys. I have three standard packages. I do not deviate from my packages. So this might not be feasible for you, but I wanted to show you, I automate this entire proposal process because I have some standard stuff. So because this is my strategy package and this person chose you know, the payment plan, the contract and invoice are going to be automatic here in a minute. So the proposal looks like this. It's standard. It tells them what they can pay. Ideally, after I've spoken with them on the phone through the discovery process, I know if they want pay in full or if they want monthly payments. And they go through this like beautiful proposal process, but it's all standard, okay? I am not customizing this. This allows me to have this run in the background when I am not awake. So here we are. They review the proposal. I tell them, you know, please mark um, that you want to work with me. Um, and of course, to let me know if they are asking for adjustments. So here I've got clear instructions that if they are even viewing on the client mobile app, the checkbox, you know, next to here is what they're going to see. And then ask them to reply here with any questions. If they mark, yes, I want to work with you. We now have, let me refresh this off screen guys, just because I don't want to release the lead information. We'll put my filters back on. Okay. So now the client approved the proposal by clicking a button. They now have a contract and an invoice sent to them. And I have the contract and invoice that goes out based on these tags. So they get an invoice and they get the contract based off of the tags. So they chose the payment plan um, and then they chose, uh, so they'll get the contract for the payment plan and the invoice for the payment plan. They also get an email telling them, I'm really excited to work with you. <laughs> so it says here, thank you for approving your proposal. You know, I've sent your contract and your invoice, you know, go ahead and log into your proposal and see what they look like or your, your uh, uh, portal. Here's what they get. They get an invoice. They chose a payment plan. So my payment plan is 12 months at 750. They only have to pay this first one. Once this is done, I go on the back end and I set up their recurring payments to take place every day on the third of the month. Here's a contract. This is the contract that I have that um, delineates uh, 12 monthly payments. It's all automatic because I have this one. So it only goes out when the payment plan is chosen and it explicitly explains the different payments. Um, the taxpayer signs it, they pay their invoice and then that moves to that next stage. So in order for the automations to work, I'm gonna first um, just unlink the invoice because once I sign the contract, it should move it. So we're just gonna sign this, all my fun legal verbiage. I will be making templates for the contracts at some point. Someone asked me to do that. And then I sign, go back here. It's still gonna show the invoices I'm paid, but it's no longer connected to the workflow. And here we've moved to new client information sent. So I have a whole bunch of stuff that goes like all the way through, right? So my onboarding process is included here. This next step is the client receives an information request. This is very cute. Um, I recommend if you guys don't have this, um, maybe consider adding this to your repertoire. But here I let them know that I'm excited to work with them and just letting them know what to expect with this organizer I need completed. Um, you know, try to let them know that I just want to make sure that their experience is good, want to remember like their life's milestones and maybe send them a token of my appreciation. Um, let them know where to find it and letting them know once I get it, I'll take a peek at it and let you know what else I might need from you. So we can, I'll just show you guys this real quick. It's super simple. It's a very simple organizer. Um, I like to ask all those things that you need to actually get started on a tax return. So, you know, we ask, what's your name? What's your date of birth? What's your social? Are you married? Do you have dependents? All of these things that sometimes we neglect to get, and then we get to the point where we're trying to prepare the return, and we don't have all this information. So I make this a part of my process. Um, if the taxpayer has um, dependents, this is repeatable. So they can add another, as many as they need to. And here I'm doing my due diligence. Please send me these items for what possibly applies. I have to remove the driver's license required because children don't need that. Um, but we, you know, we can gather all the information we need to perform our due, dil due diligence in this stage of our workflow. 
So if I were to continue through this, um, you know, they would complete the organizer and then we'd move here to our onboarding appointment. The appointment would be set. We get 20 minutes. We go over how to use Taxdom as a client. We talk about just our communication expectations and, um, you know, how we need to make sure that they're involved in the process in order for this to work. Um, part of my strategy process or my strategy services include things like getting an 8821. So I have stuff here at the end to um, just, just formalize that in our onboarding stuff. And then they go into a whole bunch of other workflows. So I, I don't wanna dig too far into the rest cause it's just not extremely pertinent to what I think you guys need to see. Hopefully this, um, demo kind of gave you an idea of like realistically what's capable and you know what we really do in our program um all of the workflows i have designed with the exception of a few others sometimes we do custom workflows i know a lot of you guys work with bank products i worked with a member in our program who um does a lot of bank products and the last bank product workflow we had was not so great so i sat with her for an hour and i said look this is going to help all of our other clients so um, here in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to have that available. So if you have bank products, we have a whole kind of qualification process in order to track where the bank products are, um, but also to um, uh, accommodate other means to maybe get payment if, let's say, uh, someone has an offset or the, the bank product isn't approved, um, ways to accommodate that as well. So lots that can be done within Taxstone. I understand you guys may have questions um, and I'm happy to answer them. I want to just go through one quick little thing before I move directly into questions because this is like information uh, overload for you guys. I had mentioned previously that you can utilize contracts as a way to communicate like short, actual kind of agreements with your clients. If you guys are not doing this, I highly recommend it. Um, this is not a template that I gatekeep. I will happily provide you this in the group. Um, I'll just post it on a post and you guys can take it as you will. But I have a um, agreement to respond timely. So I have one here for business, but I wanna show you guys the individual one. This has really helped me to make sure that my taxpayers understand like what the intention of our engagement is and all the deadlines they need to know. So every client gets this before they do anything with me, they have to agree to this. Yes, I could bury this in my engagement letter. The problem is, if it's buried in my engagement letter, most people gloss over it. And it's really important that I get this information in front of them. I did this this last year and this form saved my butt when a taxpayer came back and said, I didn't want you to file an extension for me. Um, I had given you all my paperwork and I thought you were gonna file on time. And I clearly showed all the, the information, the date she signed the agreement, the date she sent me everything and how that was beyond the date that I had set for when I need these documents and how she refused to even do certain things in the engagement, which is what prohibited me from getting her return done on time. I sent that to her and then she shut her mouth because I was, I came with receipts. Okay. I came with receipts. So this is great. I will put this in the Facebook group. I do not gatekeep this. This is super helpful. So this is explicitly for like our agreement to respond timely. So we're laying the foundation for what kind of relationship we want to have with our clients. So mutual respect, our job is very much deadline sensitive. How awful is it for a client to send you something at, you know, 9 p.m. on the deadline day and still expect that you're going to file on time? It's an absolute abuse of the relationship. And so I like to say, look, we have deadlines, you have deadlines. We all just need to work together in order to meet them and to making sure that we have a successful engagement. So I am very, very um, heavy on when I need things. My business clients get uh, one month earlier that they need to send in their documentation or else they'll be placed on extension. Also, um, you guys do have to have consent from your clients before you're allowed to file an extension. You cannot do automatic extensions. If you do, you need to have a consent of some sort. And so this is my consent to file an extension if they don't meet my deadlines. Um, I do like to provide a couple of new things, just letting them know that I'm not doing rush requests any longer. Um, that was something that we previously would allow, but we found it was really um, kind of, uh, inappropriate to push all of the other clients who took the time to get in first and get us the things that we need when we ask them to just prioritize someone else simply because they want to pay more. Um, it just didn't feel right. So now we let them know that it's more important for us to work on a first in first out basis. Um, and so we're not going to be able to accommodate those rush requests. And then also just reiterating, the extension is not to extend the payment date. It's an extension to only file the return giving them all the information, letting them know, like, we're not responsible for your late penalties. This is when they have to be paid. 
I'm also not responsible for giving you the amount that you owe before the due date. That is what the year end review is for. Um, if you have clients who say, well, I didn't know what to pay because you didn't tell me, that's poor planning on their part. These taxpayers, in many cases, if they are going to have a balance due that is similar because their income uh, situation is similar from before, there's possibly estimated tax payments. Also, tax professionals are everywhere. There's no excuse for anyone to say, I didn't know what I was going to owe in taxes because my tax guy didn't tell me. Well, then why didn't you try to get, you know, an estimate? You know, why, why didn't you get something to get a feel for what what's going to happen upon you know the due date so i let people know i'm not responsible and i'm not the one who has to tell you what you owe if you miss the year-end review or you didn't make your estimates then you better not dilly dally and take forever to give me your stuff um and just remind them like they're signed this is a contract and they're um agreeing to deliver this and if they can't they're consenting they're consenting for our office to file an extension <laughs> Um, so super, super important. I love this. Um, I started doing this this year and very, very, um, great results from this. It definitely saved my butt, but I wanted to share that with you guys. Cause this is just another way tax one allows you to share kind of short little actionable, um, requests. I think I just made it. Oh my gosh. I saved within an hour. I'm actually really proud of myself. Um, I've got a couple of questions I'm going to answer for you guys. And if you have additional questions, I will pause, um, to make sure that I get, um, through every single one of them. Um, so, um, someone's asking about, sorry guys, I can barely, I can't see, I don't have my zoom, my zoom on and my, my, uh, glasses are not helping. I have to get new glasses. Does this eliminate the need for CPA charge in job form? Uh, yes. Um, if you are using a service like Taxo, it does eliminate, um, other forms builders like job form um you still would need cpa charge because cp char cp charge um is the merchant processor that integrates with tax dome so the tax dome doesn't actually they're not their own merchant provider so cpa charge is the merchant provider but it works in conjunction with tax dome so you can like save those um documents and lock them with an invoice yeah i do have to have receipts because people are crazy oh and i had some crazy people this year um let's see Yes, I hope you guys appreciate that there's there's ways to get your clients kind of on on uh, point here. So yes, Faith assisted with that for um, needing CPA charge. I know this is a ton of information, you guys. I tried so hard to offer as much as I could without overwhelming you guys. But really, the purpose of what I want to go over with you guys today is Tax Dome does a lot. And if you're really looking for something that is just going to get you like to that next level like tax dome is it. And if you really want to see the level of crazy that you get when you sign up for a program, I have all of these pipelines, all of these, this is over 25, all of these stupid little pipelines for all the little things that I do and all the services that I offer. And, um, nobody should have this many pipelines. This is insane, but I test these for you guys regularly to ensure that you guys have working workflows and that it's just realistically like a copy and paste kind of install process, um, all the elements. So these templates are, um, uh, the pipeline templates includes all of these, your tasks, your emails, your jobs, your, your organizers. The only thing it doesn't include is contracts because you do have to have those, you know, prepared outside. We don't want to be, you know, offering like legal services. Um, but I am working with someone to take all of my contracts and get them in a template bundle. Raven might also have something for you guys if you really need something. Mine are all really crazy and weird. These are all of my stupid contracts. Um, I've got my consent to disclose, accountable plans, um, all of my representation and audit um, contracts that the lovely students of my 100K EA program get. So that's been great. But yeah, tons of, tons of templates. Um, so lots of value in our program beyond just how to set up tax dome. I have a question. How do I incorporate other services like credit repair? Um, so I don't offer credit repair, but I do have other value add services. So um, I have a different pipeline for that. Um, so my firm, I offer tax strategy, which is planning, um, tax preparation. And then I also offer resolution services. So probably what you might see as like an add value similar to, let's say, just a, a credit repair, right? Um, refers to my um, tax notices or my tax account monitoring. So this is a pipeline 
this recurs on a quarterly basis, and this is actually extremely helpful. The taxpayer receives a message and says, hey, you're on our monitoring service. Have you received any new letters that you need to bring to our attention? They can say yes or no. If they say yes, then they get an organizer reminding them, please send us front and back of all of the pages of the notice that you received. And then we let them know once that it's been submitted, that we'll review it. And we're either going to tell you what we need to do, or we're going to tell you that no action needs to take place. So um, extra services are absolutely um, available within Taxome. I don't have a workflow yet for credit repair, but if that is something that um, our audience needs, I do have people in my group who offer it, and I could always sit with them for an hour and kind of get a feel for what that looks like. Um, but there's lots of other services that can be accommodated in a pipeline here in Taxome. Yeah, so um, so Faith brings a good point just about like the way to to do the different elements of the credit repair, such as you know pulling those credit reports. Um, but from a task management and maybe like communication kind of process, um, you know the contract, the payments for your services, um, especially if they're on some kind of monthly recurring payment plan. Lots of ways in tax to like manage that process so things don't fall through the cracks. Because if you're doing things manually, you are losing losing money, whether it be through time or just through, um, you know, forgetting to, to bill somebody. Um, yeah, Xavier possibly could work. Um, not a lot of Xavier integration explicitly with Taxstone. Um, but again, if there was a way to get somebody into the system through some kind of application to request credit repair services, absolutely, you can get a workflow in there that will at least allow you to review the various stages to get them from beginning to to end. So absolutely lots of stuff that can be done on that. <laughs> Any other questions, you guys? I know lots of information. Um, you guys know where to find me in the group. You can always tag me. Um, lots of you guys are also in some of these other um, just DM kind of groups where if you have questions about taxes, uh, I love answering your questions. I If I have the answer, I am almost never going to tell you no. Um, and just as Raven does for you guys, you know, from a coaching perspective, I love now that I have a group expert badge in the group and happy to, you know, be a part of um, the process with you guys. So I'm just going to stop the screen share. And I'm, I'm going to hold um, open just for a couple more questions in case anybody has any, but I understand we might be, we might have answered all the questions because I, I do. I do happen to, to say a lot during these presentations. <laughs> Thank you um, so much. That was a yeah, lot. Um, I know. Was, oh, she said someone asked you for your calls for so the I believe, I believe our program is pay in full is um three thousand or you can pay three hundred dollars per month for 12 months. Um so that information is um is on our website workflows for tax pros. So really guys, the value of our program, a lot has to do with the template bank. So the, uh, the time frame that people explain to you how long it takes to implement Taxstone, we shortcut that. This is not like a flex. When I, when I first set up Taxstone, it took me over hundred hours. And that was like not even close to what I have now, over hundred hours. Um, so we can cut that down. Some people report as little as 10 hours to get everything set up if they utilize our template bank and they just, comprehend the material in our course. We've got lots of support. Um, so happy to um, provide more information about that if you guys have questions. My free group is Tax Pros Automations and Workflows. I understand a lot of you guys are in that group. Lots of information, free information to tell you if our group is the right fit for you and just lots of free like little master classes and templates and whatnot. Um, if you guys are just looking to see more about what we have to offer. But thank you guys so much. I am just so thankful to be here, Raven. Again, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to have gotten the chance to give you guys um, some feedback. Question about was my signature in Canva? So signature that I showed you, um, that was actually um, created in a service called Wise Stamp, W-I-S-E-S-T-A-M-P. It's a dynamic um, signature, HTML kind of like integration. And um, it's supposed to be used to help you track your marketing sources because if you email somebody and like they click on like your Facebook link, um, the email service like it recognizes that and it might say you had 45 clicks on your Facebook link. So there is some like other marketing component. I just like it because it's pretty. Um, if you want a Canva template, 
I have one. Um, it's not as pretty as that, but I'm, I'm sure I can make one if you, if you need something and you just have to understand a little bit about image hosting and then how to use something like that in a signature um, platform. But yeah, Y stamp, great product. Thank you so much, so 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 much. I um I actually learned a lot about Textdom with this um presentation because I never really used Textdom before. I guess because I don't really have the time to kind of um build it or whatever, and it was kind of a learning curve for me. <laughs> like I ain't even gonna lie, I got ADHD real bad, and it took me so uh, like a long time to even sit down and see what each of those um symbols are what it stand for and I just couldn't I think I did like four different free trials I tried it and then I couldn't uh, you know do it but the way you broke it down it made it very very simple for um uh, me to understand and, and I liked it I'm glad that I was able to sit here and watch it as well because I got a new understanding on it so thank you for that you are so welcome. So have a fabulous evening, you guys. I hope you enjoy the remainder of your education. And I'm going to sign off and see you guys later. Have a good one. Thank you. So, um, y'all, okay, so this is not the end, y'all. I, I think everybody about to log off. <laughs> I don't know this wasn't the end. Um, we really was supposed to go first. I was supposed to go first, and then she was supposed to go, but we kind of got our times mixed up. So, um, some of the information that we're gonna that I'm gonna go over, she kind of already went over some of it. So I'm gonna um kind of speed through it a little bit, but I do want to do this because I want to stay on my schedule so that everything will flow together. But today. What we're going to go over for this part is with workflows and onboarding. Of course, you guys know that this is one of the biggest, this is one of the biggest parts of your tax prep process. So you have to make sure that you have some way to keep everything organized, to keep everything in one location, and to keep, number one, our biggest thing is to keep this stuff secure, um, especially because there's so many people that's doing this completely virtual or they do things virtually and um, maybe see people in person just by request. So if you are one of the ones that do things completely virtual, then you want to make sure that you have a professional process and something that will keep you from having people DMing you um, the W-2s, they emailing you this, they text messaging you this, and all that stuff, it kind of make you go crazy. Like, I don't know if you anything like me, that was how I started out. When I first started out doing taxes, people were dropping me um, IDs, social security cards, all their kids' information in my Facebook Messenger. People would bring stuff to my house, drop it off here, drop it off there. I'm meeting people all in the parking lot. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that process of, you know, like going and meet people where they are and stuff like that. But when it comes down to bringing in their information, these are people social, these are their kids, all their kids' information. And one thing I did learn is through that process, um, real quick, one of my clients, um, you know how sometimes they may click on one of those links on Facebook, and now somebody in Nigeria done hacked their Facebook page. So um, I was, one of my clients, she had been my clients for years. She actually still is my client. And her Facebook page had got hacked. And somebody was texting me and was like, hey, hey, you heard about this cash app flip and all this stuff. So I'm like, um, that was back before it was like a real scam before people knew about it. And I'm like, what type of cash app flip? I'm talking to her because I'm thinking that's her. They had turned around and sent me a picture of her ID saying, because I'm like, this is a scam. Some, some ain't right. This is a scam. They turned around and sent me a picture of her ID and her social security card. It was like, see, this is not a scam. This is me. And I'm like, what are you? Are you serious? So I had to kind of find her. I had to pull up on her at her house because I knew what she stated. And I had to tell her like, hey, somebody hack your Facebook account. And they are, you know, sending out your social and stuff. If they sent it to me, I'm pretty sure they had sent it to any, somebody else. So ever since that situation, I stopped taking stuff on Facebook. I went through my um, Facebook Messenger and was just going through each one of my clients and deleting all that stuff, even screenshots of uh, AGIs and all of that, I would delete all of that stuff, okay? So 
That is the um, purpose of us having a professional process so that we can keep these people information secure and safe in one spot. So give me two minutes, y'all. My daughter then busted in this room. I'm so sorry. Let me get her downstairs. One second. Okay, y'all, I'm sorry. I got a busy three-year-old. <laughs> so, yeah, I do not use... One second, let me go back up to the check. I do not use Tech Dome. I, you know, I tried it. It's a lot of people that swear by Tech Dome. Even uh, one of my closest friends, she uses Tech Dome. And I've just been trying, Lord knows, I've been trying for a couple of years now to implement it. But it's just not something that works for me. And that's one of the things that I touch on, on you know, when I'm talking to people about creating processes and building workflows, you have to use what's best for you. What, what process may look easy for somebody else, it may not work for your um, firm, for your process, the needs of your office and, you know, the skill set that you have because some of these programs, they're so robust to the point where it may be a lot in a learning curve for you. So um, you have to just use what works for you. So that's what we're going to be talking about today sweet dash yeah sweet dash is definitely great um we um way easier text prep workflow is always way easier oh yeah i think i did get a um demo of her text prep workflow when i very first like met her so it's real quick we got like another hour so today we're going to be going over the importance of having a professional process stages of a workflow how to start creating your process or your workflow, and we'll do a live Q&A. And I'm going to also real quick show y'all a um, just a, what my process is, what it looks like, and how i kind of been working with it for the last like two years. And looks like that's what we'll be working on this year because I just don't have the time to build another one. So that's what we're going to be going over today. Now, one of the things, well, a couple of reasons why it's important for you to have a professional process or a workflow is number one, it keeps you organized and all of the documents in one location. So you, like I said, that horrible situation that happened with one of my clients, you don't want to have that information in Facebook. You don't want to have people texting you and sending you all this because what happens is some stuff might get lost. You um try to say, dog, I knew I had this. And let's just say, for instance, you crack your phone screen and the phone gets destroyed, but none of the documents were backed up. So now you got years worth of documents that, you know, may be in a phone or on a hard drive that may be, um, you know, completely messed up. So you want to keep all that stuff in a safe and secure space. It also helps save you time and frustration because like when you have people coming from all different directions, like I said, if you got them on Messenger, you got them in your Facebook DM, you got them in your Instagram DM, you don't have, to, you can have that process to where even if they're coming from those different directions, you can still center them to one location. Like, hey, I've been doing marketing everywhere. I got Facebook, Instagram, I got ads, I got this, I got that. Even though I have all of this stuff, you can bring in those, all of those leads and all of those potential clients to one workflow. And that's the whole, it saves you so much time and energy of having to go to three, um, 10 different locations to pull tax information. It also keeps your office streamlined because with, when you're dealing with a workflow or even having it automated, it keeps everything like a, um, I saw on her slide, she said having it like a lean, mean tax machine. And that's a, exactly what it does. It keeps everything in order so that no matter who comes into your firm, even if it's you right now as a single preparer or a single preparer firm, eventually you will want to grow. So when you are able to grow, and even wh whether that's growing with having preparers or having employees or having clients, 
because one thing about it when you when you're starting at a um you know you just start to learn how to do taxes and you're getting your clients not everybody jumps out and get 100 and 200 clients as their first like couple of years it takes time to build that so of course a smaller process may work for you or having people sending your sending you documents through um email and text it may work then but when you truly want to scale and get in those hundreds of clients you are going to need a simplified and a streamlined process and um it also allows you to keep your office in compliance when you, of course, y'all know we have to keep these people documents safe. This is not nothing that we can escape from. And um, even if it feels as though, you know, okay, it's been working. I haven't been having those type of issues with data security. You just never know when something may happen and you want to make sure that you're doing your part to keep these people information safe. And it also allows for easy delegation and duplication. So with delegation, when you start to bring in VAs, um, hiring assistants, hiring employees, whether you have like a compliance person, whatever that looks like for you in your office, having a workflow will make it so much easier because you can, um, for example, with my office, I have a tax prep process and each stage of the process it's a task for somebody. So if you have that outline and you know what each stage is and what each stage does, you can give each person or um, have have whatever person you want to do it. You can have them and you will say, look, this is what I need you to do. This is your task. Your task is to make sure that all of the returns before they are transmitted, that it passes our quality control or quality review compliance process. So it keeps that in, um, it keeps it so streamlined to the point where everybody knows their place and what needs to be done. And um, dealing with a workflow, it also helps you be able to duplicate it. So it, that doesn't mean that you'll go out building workflows for people. For other people, it means that, hey, if I want to expand. So for example, a lot of people are starting service bureaus. That's like one of the uh, when you start to do taxes and you feel like you can take it to the next level and do service bureau, when you have a workflow that's already set, you can and then um, send that workflow and have your downline copy that same workflow. So when you start to teach them, this is the way that you teach them using what you know. So that anytime you see somebody talking about like blueprints and stuff like that, that's their workflow that works for them. And now they're teaching you their workflow. So if that's anytime you see anybody telling you something like that, that's more than likely what they're doing is that whatever process is working for them, they're going to in turn duplicate it and show you how you can use that same process or that same workflow to get the same, if not greater, um, success than they had. All right. Now, uh, what does a professional process or workflow look like? Number one, it's seamless, which means you are able to move from step to step without having too many problems or interference. Now, of course, because the tax prep process it's going to have to have some form of human interaction. It is not going to be able to go 100% automated. So that really, uh, having too much interference really isn't a good analogy, but at the same time, it should not have to be anything that is like too complicated or anything that um, has problems or you like, okay, hold on, I got to stop and do this. I can't move it on until I do that. So it needs to be seamless. The next thing that your um, workflow needs to be is uncomplicated. One thing about it, these people want instant gratification. If it's too complicated, they may say, uh-uh, forget it. If they go to your site today or if they go on your Facebook page and um, you, let's say you post your flyer, right? And somebody is attracted to your flyer and say, hmm, I, let me see what she's talking about. Or even if they, let's just take it a step further. They see your flyer and they say, dog, I don't want her to do my taxes. Let me look and see how I need to get started. If it's, if you can't take them from them wanting to um, get you to file their taxes all the way up until their tax prep process, if it does not flow seamlessly or if it's too complicated, you very well, very well may lose them as a client. In 2022, the chances of somebody having a printer and, you know, and, and scanner and all this, having to deal with those paper forms, the chances of that is very slim. 
nine times out of ten, a lot of people are looking for something that's like really quick, something an app they can download, some for of like a form that they can do online straight from their phone. They just snap a quick picture and go. If you notice, like a lot of the competition, the big competition, they have those types of programs to where um, I think what is TurboTax, you, if you scan the W-2, it can like auto read and all this stuff. So even though we don't have that type of technology and we don't need to because we're performing that service for them, we still need to be able to compete with the ease of it. Because if our process is so difficult or if it's something that is not um, in competition with the big chains, then ultimately we may lose them as a client. Y'all know there's no loyalty in this stuff. You can have a person that has been following with you since you opened. And it may be somebody else that comes along with an easier process that snatched them as a client. So you have to always remain current on what is going on, keep up with the times, keep up with the uh, process and stuff like that because it keeps you in, a, uh, in an even playing field. And the next thing it needs to be is secure and compliant. Of course, same thing, just reiterating. You have to make sure you're keeping these people information secure as, as secure as you can. And you also, um, there are several things by Circle of 230 and IRS guidelines that we have to follow when it comes down to dealing with this sensitive information. And of course, you want it to be professionally branded. Um, you want your information, your logo, your name, your um, social media handles, all this stuff needs to be all over anything you do. Because what will happen if somebody see your flyer? Let's just say you get some business, um, some business cards or some flyers printed up. It does not have your logo or does not have anything on there for your branding. Then a person don't know which way to go. They don't know whose stuff is this. The same thing, especially in a virtual world. Anytime you are putting out some piece of content, whether it is a picture, whether it is a flyer, a tax tip, you need to have it professionally branded so that people will know that it's yours. Okay. Now, the next step here is a part, here's the different parts of a tax prep workflow. So this part in yellow is the actual process that will need some sort of like human intervention. This will be the time, this will be the part where you actually will do your job, your team will do their job, and this will be something that you will have to kind of go back and forth with your client about. But the other part, this marketing, the lead, client acquisition and onboarding. The good thing about this is most of that can be completely automated. This is where um, when people say I make money in my sleep or I get clients in my sleep, if you have that part automated, when it's time, to, when you get ready and get up in the morning, you head to your office or you go to your workspace at your house and it's time for you to work, you should be waking up with clients at your whatever form you use, whatever system you use, ready for you to work okay and that may seem like oh my god that sounds like so far-fetched but it's really not and um number one you do not have to spend a whole ton of money doing so number two you can already use the systems that you use and make them work together number three if you are a person that you know is just getting started like you really don't have a clientele yet, you actually are in a better position than some of us who are trying to get it right down the line. Lord knows if I knew about this stuff way back when, I would have been listening. I probably would have had 5,000 clients by now, seriously, because last year, well, two years before that, that's when I really started like this whole automation thing. During COVID, it really forced us to get a professional process because we, we, everything was closed so now you know it's like you got to do it or you will get lost and now because of COVID you know people saw that how easy it was to do stuff virtually so a lot of people are still doing it as you can see even in some of these stores whatever they did during the COVID time they still doing it now because you know it worked for them so this is the parts of your uh, workflow some of this may vary based upon like what your process is or what services you provide, this is more so geared towards people that does bike products, okay? Because most of us do. I, I don't care how many clients I get to pay up front, I'm going forever off one bank product, okay? So this is that process for um, mostly for people that work with bank products. So the first stage is your marketing stage, okay? This is the stage where you are trying to get that client, okay? Even if you have a, um, a established clientele, 
you still have to market to them. You still have to nurture them because like I said, there is no loyalty in this. And just because the person been following with you don't mean that they're going to automatically come back. You still have to appeal to them. You still have to prove to them that you are worthy for to do their taxes. So usually this would occur more than one time before moving to the next step. So for somebody that is, um, you know, engaging with your brand or before they get ready to even say, hmm, let me see more about this business or let me see more about this girl I keep seeing on my timeline, they will have to kind of see you a few times. They'll scroll by it. They may not like nothing. They may not, you know, comment on nothing, but they still will probably be watching. Even if anybody, you know, has ever put their page on um, professional mode, you will see you probably get a lot of reach and a lot of people scrolling by your content, but it probably don't even match to the number of people that are liking and engaging because sometimes people have to see it a few times before they um, actually, you know, choose to go with the person or buy the product. This can occur in many places and many methods. So most tax preparers, we market um, social media, uh, word of mouth marketing, all of this stuff, but you want to have a multiple array of marketing. You never want to just, you know, unless it's working for you, but even still, you should always have a backup plan to where, okay, if I'm not, if I can't market on social media, how will I reach my clients? Y'all know Mark Zuckerberg be knocking folks off Facebook. He be kicking folks, banning folks. So just imagine, Lord, knock on wood, it don't happen to nobody. But just imagine, just imagine if your Facebook page was right at the beginning, on January 1st, just imagine your, if your Facebook page was blocked or if you wake up and you can't even log in. How would you reach your clients? How would you be able to do that if you don't have any other forms of marketing or any way to reach them. So that is always something that you have to think about. One of my uh, friend girls, she just went through a situation where she lost her whole Facebook page. She had to get a whole nother one. So you have to always think about that when you're doing your marketing. And like I said, your returning client still needs to be marketing too. Now we're gonna have, we're gonna do a whole day towards marketing. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on each one of these marketing tactics, but here's just a few strategies. Every, every tax preparer, you need to be able to reach your clients through email and SMS, period. So if you do not have that, we go, you, this needs to be your task so that you need to complete by the end of the week. You need to have you an email marketing um, company and an SMS marketing company. Now, some of these um, providers, and we'll go over this on tomorrow, so hang tight before you go and buy anything tonight or tomorrow, okay? So just wait until the class tomorrow so that I can show you the different programs and how they work. But there are some that can give you email marketing and free for like 30 days, 60 days. So if you're a brand new preparer or if, a, if you are a preparer that's on a tight budget, shoot, stuff is high as hell out here. So I get it. Please, I completely understand it. Um, you may need to wait until like the last week of December or the first week of January to do your free trial because that can get you through the bulk of the tax season without even having to pay. Now, I would suggest in February or March when you, you know, when we get our big deposits, go ahead and purchase your stuff for the next upcoming season. So you can do it for the annual. That way you won't have to pay again until this next time when you get your next big drop. And that's another thing we're gonna be going over on day eight is financing and budgeting and how to kind of you know deal with us being seasonal workers. A lot of us get our money in one walk. Like this is the most we're gonna, this is all we're gonna get, honestly, from uh and it has to last us the whole year. So I'm gonna bring in a um the person that I that, that you that helped me this year get my finances in order and learn how to do budgeting. He's actually a great financial manager and he helps you like kind of get everything um organized and calm through your financials. So he's gonna be doing a presentation on day eight to kind of help and guide you as well on how to manage those, um, you know, the type of income that we have. Now uh, with marketing as well. You can do networking, billboards, flyers, stuff like that, referral agents. You can get brand partnerships. But for anybody that's going to be doing um, flyers, any type of print, uh, marketing stuff, you need to make sure you put a 
QR code on it, okay? Make sure, do not print up any flyers, any business cards, any hangers, EDDM, without a QR code on it. And that QR code needs to be something that will start the onboarding process. Or you can do a funnel, or you can do a, a sales page or something like that to where you are number one, you are getting that lead. So anybody that scans that QR code on your flyer or on your um, business card, you need to get their email and their phone number, period. Because you don't want to lose that lead, all right? Now, the next stage, oh, and I jumped ahead of myself, but all of your marketing should include some sort of call to action. And this a call to action means what do they need to do when they see it? So if you make a post on Facebook and it may be given out a tax tip, you can do something simple as, hey, if you're seeing this post, I need you to follow me. If you see this post, I need you to hit the link in my bio to grab your free, let's say, tax checklist. So that is something that you can um, also do to build your email list, but it needs to have a call to action on there. If not, what they're going to do, they're going to scroll right by you. And that could have been a potential person that you can, um, you know, start marketing to or reach in the future. So every post or everything needs a call to action. Also, like I just said, for every printing material that you have, you need to have a QR code on it so that they can scan it. Even some stuff on social media, um, you may can put a QR code on it, but you can't scan a QR code if you're on your phone. So that's why I said all of your print items. Even um, I seen somebody last year put a QR code on a t-shirt and I thought that was a very good um, thing, a good marketing tool. So definitely all of that business cards and stuff, I would for sure put a QR code on it. And um, also all of your marketing should include some ways to captivate the lead. So like I said, you need to have something to where you're getting their email or in their phone number. So if you have, and it's something we're going to be going over in the next couple of slides, but if you have an SMS, um, a text message marketing company, you can have a keyword to where they're texting, let's say taxes to whatever your phone number is or text tax tip to such, such, such. So you need something with like a keyword so that you can captivate either their phone number or you can do like a, um, what is it called? A landing page to where you're getting their emails and stuff. And the last thing you need to also make sure you have your logo or your branding all over. Anytime you get, uh, you put any piece of content out, make sure it aligns with your brand. Reason being is you, you want to start to program their minds to when they see whatever your brand color is, they'll know, hey, this must be such and such stuff. Because right now, if you were to go on Facebook or on Instagram, wherever, even if you go outside and saw a billboard and you see the word taxes and you see a green square, automatically before you even see who it is, who are you, who is your brain going to um, associate that with? It's going to associate that with h and Block. If you see purple and I think it's blue, I'm not sure. I, thought, I forgot what colors they are, but I know for a fact it's um, purple. If you see that, you may associate that with Jackson Hewitt. So that's what I mean about um, getting that branding and putting it everywhere. So anytime that they see your colors, they, it, they'll they say, oh, they look like such and such stuff. So make sure you do that. Yep, that was your, I knew I remember um, some, it was somebody who did it and that was her. She put her QR code on the back of her shirt and that was a great idea because you can be, you um, you know, a lot of times we put our brand on our like shirts and stuff, we'll get it pressed on or uh, we'll get it threaded on and stuff. You can actually put that QR code on there because the person will scan it just to see what pop up. I scan QR codes all the time. Now with your leads, um, you can use a print on demand option. Oh yeah, the um print. I think Canva does printing. And um, if you want to get creative, if you have enough time, buy you a Cricut. Cricut's like one ninety nine, two hundred dollars, and the heat press is like a hundred dollars as well. And um, it can save you down the line on buying some of that stuff. You just have to learn how to use it, but it can save you um, down the line for you doing it on your own. Now, if you start printing up, uh, if you have like a whole lot of stuff you need to get printed up, I definitely recommend, you know, you outsource that. Now, excuse me, with your leads, this comes from a person seeing, engaging, or reacting to your marketing. 
So anytime, you know, somebody's out there and on, let's say, on social media or even if they see, let's say, your flyers um, posted somewhere and they look at it and they stop, that person is in a potential lead because if they even looked at it or engaged in it, then that means that, um, you know, it, it was something that captivated them. So you want to grab that person in because that person can potentially be a client one day. So, of course, a lead is a potential tax client. And um, in your marketing, you need to make sure that you have a way to captivate their leads so that you can keep them. This is how you start to build your email list. A lot of times, this is done. You're not really trying to sell them. You're not really trying to say, hey, follow me, follow me. A lot of times, this comes from you um, educating them, you giving them, maybe you going live. Maybe this is something that you're doing. For example, you might be doing a, um, you know how people go to the high schools and talk. They may be doing a podcast. This may be a YouTube video. So all of this stuff is a way for you to um, kind of indirectly market to them. That can be like a freebie. Hey, I got this free checklist. I got this free um, ebook letting you know how you can save taxes as a truck driver. So this is it's still you marketing in a sense because you are getting their email and their phone number to one day, you know, get, um, tell them, hey, I found taxes. Um, you may be considering coming to file with me. And this is one of the great ways for you to start building your client. Uh, is my stuff echoing? Wait a minute. It, um, somebody might be on mute. Okay, here we go. So whatever you do, you need to have a call to action as well, like I said, to get your email and your phone. So a couple of ways to captivate the leads is by using some form of a lead generator, a funnel, email, and SMS list. Now to bring it kind of back to taxes, giveaways are always, are always the best, one of the best ways for you to build your email list and build your text message list and also get tax leads because some people will file with a person just for the purpose. I know this may um, you know, sound crazy, but a lot of people do that. They want to see who giving the most. Now, not everybody is like that, but it's some that's not like that's like that. Y'all giving away a car? Okay, I'm following with you. Y'all giving away a BBL? Okay, I'm following with you. I have been seeing that a lot this year. Uh, people giving away BBLs. I almost want to file with them. That's a good marketing. <laughs> but no, for real, um, people want it. Like a giveaway is one of the the best ways to market. One of the easiest things that you can do, of course, I'm pretty sure a lot of you know by now is by doing the vacation vouchers. Um, they, the Marketing Booth has a great um, package now where it's free. You don't have to pay for, I think, like up to five destinations. So I'm going to link that inside of the um, link tree for the challenge. That way you can go in there and create your Marketing Booth account. But um, that is where you get the vacation vouchers from. And it's another one. I think it's Creative Marketing Incentives. Y'all, please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a long day. I'm talking with my eyes closed. But I think that's the one. Um, that's the right one. That's right. Okay, cool. That's comparable with um, marketing boost. So giveaways are good. Now, you don't have to not feel bad if you can't give away no BBL or no car or paying nobody rent. It's also other ways that you can do. People barter services. So like, hey, if you got a tax client, if you have a client, that does, let's say, they braid hair. So instead of you um, doing a tax prep fee, you say, hey, I want to do a giveaway and I want to give away, let's say, um, three free hairstyles or something like that. You got to get creative in these damn times to come up with stuff like that. Everything don't have to be monetary. Everything does not have to have like, um, you know, a lot of value to it in that way, like a monetary value. You can do services. You can do um, all sorts of stuff if you have another business. So, for example, if you do, let's say, a skincare brand, you can give away some skincare products. It doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. Um, freebies are also a great way to build your email list and build your SMS list and one day um, market to those type of clients so that you can, um, you know, have them as a client in the future. So, some good things to give away as a tax preparer. It could be um, ebooks. Of course, there are people you don't necessarily have to market them to other tax professionals, but you can market them to your tax client. Whatever your niche is, whatever um, type of clients you work with the most, 
create documents and create some certain things for them. So for example, if you have a lot of Schedule C clients, a lot of business owners, what are some things that they could be, um, be that they can use? So for example, um, DoorDash drivers, they can use like a, a dominator um, tracker or a mileage tracker or um, what else? Some little tax tips that they can do or that they can use throughout the year. So a little freebie, some stuff that probably take you like five minutes to create on Canva. And that's a great way for you to start bringing in potential clients. If you have time to go live, you can go live and, um, you know, give out good tax tips. You can go live and talk about what's going on this season. And that can be a great way for you to bring in that potential clients. Pay ads, networking, and sales pays are also a good way to um, captivate those leads. So you have to, people have to know you exist. They have to know that you do taxes in order for them to even give you a chance to do it. So that is the great, that is the um, biggest thing about building your clientele. You have to use a mixture of these strategies a mixture of these marketing tools so that you can get your clients. Um, create a custom discount for giveaways, custom discount. Oh yeah, you can do that inside of the software um, over the $37 per month. I only pay it one month. After that one month, I'm done with that. I'm so glad they got the free version because I, uh -uh, I was not about to keep paying them for that stuff. And I don't even think my clients even go on their trip. So after um, you start doing your leads, at this point, this person has decided, yes, I want you to file my taxes. So this is that part where I call the client acquisition. Now, it does not stop here. Y'all know people will say, yeah, I want you to do my taxes. And then <laughs> it's something, whatever it is, it prevents them from doing so or they change their mind. And for me, a, um, a couple of years ago, I said about three years ago, it was because I did not have a process. So people would email me or I, you know, I was trying to get the stuff um, done and trying to get everything organized. I would um, create the process that I had. It was so ghetto. Oh my God. I would like have them create an appointment and it was just like, my God, I didn't even have like an office or anything. So I was having them create an um, appointment and we would like be texting back and forth. I'm like, okay, what's this? What's that? Did you have this? Did you have that? It was just so time consuming. I cringe when I think about it. So um, you have to make sure that you have a clear process so that if somebody is engaging with your brand, let's say at three in the morning, you are in the bed slobbing, scratching, and you ain't, you ain't, <laughs> you do not have time to direct nobody and tell them, okay, hey, this is what I need you to do. The first step is for you to Go here, send me this. Once you're done with that, go there. You don't have time to do that because you are asleep. So a person might be searching and they may have every intention on filing with you. But if your process is not clear or if your process is not laid out to the point where they can easily know this is my step, this is the next one. And then once you're done with that, wait. Then they won't, you know, they, they will not, they probably won't be back. Now, this is where your workflows and your CRM or your tools will come in handy. And of course, this will vary, especially for brick and mortar companies, because they don't have no choice. If you have a physical tax office, they have no choice but to wait until your office hours to um, come in and do their taxes. Now, in this day and age, a person coming into an office, that means they really, really want to. So um, they will have no choice but to wait on you. Now, things that are that can be faced in this stage, y'all. I'm so sorry. I listen, I was halfway sleep typing this stuff. The grammar is horrible on here. I'm so embarrassed. So not having a clear process can definitely be something that um, makes this stage kind of difficult. And um, the process not being easy for them can make it um to where like a client will say, well. Um, maybe I'm not going to go with her this year or, you know, a lady may be wanting to and they may not, you know, go through that process because it's just not easy to. So an example of that is if you have a um, like PDF forms on your website and they may not have a printer accessible, but that's the only way that they can do it. So that may not be easy enough for them. So they may, you know, go off. A lot of times when you have your website some of those websites have some very, very 
strong and um, robust analytics. So you can actually see Wix. I know for sure has it. Like anytime a person has, let's say, uh, subscribe to your website, anytime they go on their website with that same device or that same IP address, you can monitor their behaviors on your website. So when you go, when they go on there and you will see exactly what made them click off or what page they clicked off on or what, um, you know, they were trying to do. And a lot of times, like, um, I have, like, different coaching sessions with people, and that's one of the things that, and that's why I'm constantly doing, um, going back to this type of example, because that's some of the most recent things that I had kind of saw on somebody's website that I was helping her with. She had PDF forms on there. So every time, you know, we was kind of, like, looking at the um, engagement on there and looking to see what people were doing. And when they got to that page, they'll leave. Like, they'll download the form, and then they'll leave. And so she was like, I didn't even know that people were downloading it. They never came to file. So that may be a drawback to, you know, her process was because that form, it was not fillable. Now, if you have PDF forms, you may need to make them fillable so that a person can just go on there and fill that form and download it and send it back. Now, that is a lot of steps, but some people know how to do that. Now, um the next thing is not it's not being too um the process is too inconvenient now that's another you know things like going back to the same thing with the pdfs that they don't have a printer of course they're not able to you know print it out and send it back the process is non-existent so if it is not a clear process or if on the website you say hey file with us today but when you go to the button there the button doesn't click or if it does not have anything on there about hey this is where I need you to file it. Or if you're on, if you're marketing on social media and it says you have you post your flyer and say come file with us, but there's no process there to where the person can just go and start onboarding, then that's a problem. That's where a lot of people they call those dead leads. That's where a lot of people end up not being able to grow and um, are stagnant because of stuff like that. And if the process takes too long. So a lot of times, like I said, this is, we are in the world of instant gratification. We have been subconsciously uh, conditioned to quick stuff. Y'all know with the short videos, every time, <laughs> um, like uh, reels and stuff, they're only like seven to 10 seconds. So subconsciously, our minds have been conditioned to quick. So you have about seven to 10 seconds to captivate somebody. And yes, even with taxes, even something that is, um, you know, mandatory that we all have to do. If they can't get to that process in like seven to 10 seconds, it may be difficult. A person has to really, really want to file with you in order to, you know, make it work and really search it. But if you got somebody that's brand new and they're just seeing ads and stuff on social media, you got about seven to 10 seconds in order for you to make that process very clear for them. If it's too long or if it's just not working, um, so for example, if it has broken links, if you go and it's giving them like a 404 error, a 504 error, you know, sometimes our websites may not be configured correctly. If the automations are not configured correctly. So for example, um, I use Zapier for some of the programs that I use. And Zapier, um, I don't know if it's Zapier, Zapier, whichever way you pronounce it, but um, they, it was not configuring or not firing correctly. So a lot of my automations did not work. So that could be a process that, you know, ultimately will say, well, look, this is too difficult. I'm about to leave. So you want to make sure your process is simple. It does not have to be long and drawn out. It does not have to have 10, 15 steps. You can make it super, super simple. And that's where your CRMs and all of that stuff will um, come in handy. In. Now, of course, this process is, like I said, the most uh, important process in your whole firm, and that's going to be your onboarding process. Now, this is the most important step, make it count. But honestly, this is like the hardest thing to kind of conquer because you may go through trial and error, um, especially when you are trying to find what process works for you, what CRM work best for you, 
what project management software work best for you. So you might have to kind of go through and um, do a, a, what you call a free trial to see what works. But the best thing, we're going to go through this in the next couple of slides, is to try to see what you already use so that you can use that in order to build your process. So you want your process to be so thorough that you won't have to do a follow-up call and say like, hey, I'm missing this. I don't have this. Did you get a chance to do this? You want your process to be as thorough as possible so that you can get everything that you need in that first go round. The more automated, the better. You can truly scale and get more clients when, like I said, just imagine being able to, when you get up to go to, go to work every day during tax season, all you have to do is just go to one location and you can just start knocking those clients off the list. That sounds like heaven, right? Especially for somebody that is ready to scale. Like I said, you know, we pray for six or seven figures. We pray for our hundreds of clients and increase and manifest in whichever way you want to call it. But we have to be truly ready to receive that. And that is where your process, your workflow will come in handy. And you want this to be as easy as possible. So onboarding tips, whatever system you use, make sure it is compatible with a mobile phone. Most of your clients may not be on a computer. They doing it right from their phone where they can snap that picture and go ahead and as soon as they get that W-2 in the mail, they about to ready to take a picture and send it to you. So you, you want to make sure your process is, it looks just as good as it does on the, on the computer, on the phone, just like it does on the computer, all right? Now get as much information as possible during this stage and also make it conditional because one thing about it, you do not want somebody that does not own a business they have to shuffle through all these business questions. You don't want nobody that's not itemizing having to worry about medical deductions and all this stuff. So make sure you have that conditional so that they can answer what pertains to them. Now, um, this part of the tax prep process is the part where you, after your client onboards, this is where you get to do your magic. Now, this part right here is what we're going to focus on on tomorrow, we're going to dissect each one of these um, sections, and I'm going to show you how you can use that and um, use certain programs in order to make this process work, okay? Now, um, that's why I'm going to skip through this. Now, when you choose the right program, and this is what I kind of challenge you guys to do today, so when we go on tomorrow, you can have a kind of like a clear understanding of what you need so when i'm showing you how to use each program or what program it is and what type of features they have you can say well nope i don't need to use this one because i don't need xyz or you can say hmm let me take a further look at let's say um job form because i noticed that it has six of the seven things that i need on my list so the first thing you want to do is outline your current steps of your own workflow or your tax prep process thoroughly and outline each action that's needed. So for example, let's go back to this list right here. So for example, with your compliance, your preparation, compliance, and quality control, you will look at that process in, uh, at that topic and you will see exactly what is needed. So in order to file somebody's taxes, of course you need all of their documents. So what tools do you currently use to get all of your client's documents? What tools do you currently use to do the compliance process or the quality, quality control or review process, especially for people that have big teams? That's where that will come in at. Um, what type of system do you use to get your payment? If that is going to be your bank product, then that's what, you know, you can fill that in there. And with the funding, how do you, once your client get funding, what's next? So that is what you can do and go through that process in your workbook as well on the page. If you're looking at it, it's going to have five different steps. It has the intake process, review and preparation, due diligence, e-sign. So you want to um, dissect that and you can use that one as a template as well if you would like so that you can look on each one of those steps and write out what um, what programs that you have that you already use that you can go through and do each one of these steps. Now, the next step is, of course, look at what system you already use and see where they fit. 
And when you do that, you can find any integrations among the system that you already use. So for example, if you, once you get through with your process and you list out all of the tools that you use, and it says that, okay, in my system, I use job form, I use um, Gmail, my professional email, and I also use, let's say, Grasshopper, right? So you can, uh, you can try to find a way and see if each one of those systems integrate together. So for example, let's just say you use Zapier to where if you use job form and they submit a document and they submit their tax prep um, organizer for the year, once they submit it, then Grasshopper will automatically send them a text message to tell them, hey, we received your um, organizer. We'll be getting back with you soon. That's the purpose of Zapier. And I'm going to show you all about this in just a second. This is our last slide. And um, these are examples, and that's what we're going to be going over. So we already did. Um, Jessica, she showed you using TaxDome. Shakar will be showing you using Job Form on tomorrow. And I'm about to real quick show y'all my process. And this is using um, Cognito Form and Active Campaign. And I'm also going to be adding in a um, workflow for Sweet Dash. And we're going to be showing you guys how that works because I really, really think that that's going to be a very great and robust system for you guys to use, okay? What I did when I saw that someone would only fill out part of my form, I would email them to see what's the issue so I can recapture that client. Um, one of my QR codes expired. I had no ideas. I didn't know that they expired either. I'm glad you said that because I usually use mine through Canva. I didn't know that they expired. Let me go back through the questions. So this is my process, y'all. This is what I use. I was trying to make sure I went through all of the questions. Okay, so this is the process that I use with my clients. This was actually the process from um, last year. I just tweaked it to add a couple of things. Um, the new SMS program that I use, which is Burst SMS, is super, super cheap for um, a lot of client for a lot of um, messages because a lot of these SMS things as well as email marketing, they may be affordable, but for lower volume. And um, I needed a lot of messages to send out. So um, it's the burst SMS work better for me and it works in the, and it integrates directly with this um, active campaign. That's what I use. Now, full disclosure, active campaign is not going to work for everybody. OK, this is still it's a learning curve. But me, I'm a very visual person. I have to physically see this stuff. And that's the reason why I like this, because you can clearly see the roadmap as opposed to, um, you know, some of the other ones, even with um, when I go through with my other, like my pipeline, you'll see exactly what I mean. So start with my process. Let's go here. This is the actual form that my clients filled out this last, this tax season. So in tw for 2022, 2021 tax season, this is what they signed. So when I was telling you guys about the conditional, that means that anything that they, that does not pertain to them, um, they don't really see. So for example, this act, do you have dependents? So with this form, you don't see dependents on here anywhere um, unless they say, yes, I have dependents. So it will only pop up in that event. So they will only answer the questions that is, um, you know, pertaining to them. Same thing with the income. They will only see that type of income is if they put self-employment here. So they will only see that if they have that type of income. So same thing with just like uh, owning, owning student loans. Certain questions will trigger certain things to pop up. That way they won't have all this long stuff to fill out. And um, this little red dot beside the name and the date of birth and all of that, that means that it is required. And the reason why I took it off on like the address and the phone and stuff is because some of my um, returning clients, they had the same information. So a lot of that stuff, I didn't want them to have to keep filling out over and over again. But um, you can make it required for everybody so that they won't miss a step, okay? 
Um, that was another thing I can kind of truly say <laughs> that my next year form, it will definitely have most of this stuff required because I was thinking about my returning clients, but my new clients were not filling the stuff out, you know, because sometimes people will only um, enter in what is absolutely required. So if you go ahead and do that on the front end, you won't have to worry about asking them to come in and do it again. Now, the one thing I like about um, Cognito form is that you can, um, if they do not submit this document, like if they save it, um, you can um, go back, and, like they can go back and go to it again. It's self for, I don't know if job form does it. I don't really use job form a whole, whole lot in my firm. I only use it for like um, stuff on the tax pro side, but I like the fact that you can still capture a lead if they go on here and start the process, but they may not have finished it. So once I got your email and your phone, you on my list, boo. <laughs> so that's why I like um, Cognito form. I did not know that you can make it so it doesn't show if they're a returning client. Oh, yep, yep, yep. If they put it in their box up there, because I last year I did not have this, yeah, this tax, this past tax season, I did not have a spot for asking them if they are returning or if they are new. But I'm definitely building it on my form for this year because I'm starting completely over with my form for um this year. Now, a lot of people build out their um, what you call it, your um that engagement letter, they'll put theirs inside of here as well and just put the signature block and i think that is genius so that's another thing i'm going to be doing as well contrary to popular belief i do learn a lot from y'all so once this process is done once they go in here and upload all of their documents we have everything then what happens is they will automatically go to my list so these systems integrate together so that um once all this information here it will automatically come to my active campaign and I can see them on my workflow. This is the workflow and I can also see them on my pipeline. And it will also add them as a contact to my SMS list. Now, um, I'm also using this um, active campaign has an email marketing platform already built into it. So I don't have to subscribe them to another email marketing platform or integrate one because that is something that's already here. So uh, once it creates them a contact and it adds them as a deal. Now with this deal word, a lot of times you will see this on a certain CRMs because basically they are being used for sales. And in a nutshell, tax V is kind of like a sale because until you win that client, until you get um, all, go all the way through the whole process and get paid for them, you still have to hope and pray you get paid. You get what I'm saying? So it still is a sales pipeline. So um, they will get an email to let them know, like, hey, we received your documents. Here's what's next. So this cuts down on a lot of that. Hey, what's next? Did you get my stuff? It lets them know automatically, thank you for choosing us to file your return. We know that you have many choices when it comes to this tax stuff, and we are grateful that you chose us. Um, here's all the information needed and what's next, and I just outlined it real good for them. So if they actually take the time to read it, they won't have to ask me what's next. So um, they also get an SMS message as well. So they get an email and a text message at the same time, pretty much telling them the same thing. Now here is where um, when, any, when somebody starts that process of onboarding, then it'll send an email to my team to let them know, hey, is somebody there? Because that's where my data entry person will start the process. I don't initiate the process of returns. I let them put in the um, their first page on TaxLayer, the dependents information, and the W-2. Everything else I do, okay? So if that person has a just a W-2 return, it's pretty much already done when I get up for work every day to start the process of what I have to do. So I'll do the due diligence. I'll do the um, Schedule Cs and all of that. But pretty much my um, intake and all of that is already done when I get there. So it'll give them a notification and it'll also set them a task to let them know, here's the people that you need to be working on. And it's also integrated to where I don't have to give them access to my um, Cognito form because all of the information that's on that Cognito form, including the attachments, 
are in a zip file, okay? So it's in a zip file and it will automatically go in this system. Now, right here is where, this is where inter human intervention is needed, okay? So this is where, along with when we're working and when we're going through those processes and um, they're doing what they need to do and I have to do what I need to do, as we're working, it will update the client, okay? Now, of course, this process is not going to read our minds or know, okay, after a certain amount of time, go ahead and send this message. No, it's on a, gonna only do that when we tell it to, and I'll show you exactly what I mean in just a second. So after um, that we send them their client portal, then they'll get an email saying, hey, you got, here's our client portal. You got an invite. And if for y'all that don't know, that is the one in tax layer. So that's that tax layer portal. And if y'all know that you have to, um, in order to send them a portal, you have to actually start the process of filing the return. So this is why we cannot send out this portal invite until we actually create the portal for them. So that's why it has to be um, met. Now, once we in that pipeline, and I'll show you exactly what I mean in just a second. Once in that pipeline that we are done with the actual return and the return needs a signature. So that's where I'll be um, taking that client from the, um, in, from the portal seat tab to the need signature tab. That's the part that I'll do. So it's like a baton in a relay race. We're passing off that return or that client from one stage to the next as we're working. So once it's done and we need that client signature, it'll send them a message, a text message, and it'll also send them an email like, hey, your return is um, done. Please come sign it. Y'all ought to see how fast they be signing them returns. <laughs> they be signing them returns um, for <laughs> when they want them advances. So um, the next stage is, of course, they're going to get a notification to go back and check it. So after 30 minutes, every 30 minutes, they're, um, the staff is going to get a notification to um, like, hey, do we sent out the return for signature? Because one thing I do not like is that okay, less than three weeks, text me to start. Let me read it real quick. Okay, there we go. So, um, where was I, y'all? So, yeah, so y'all know with tax layer, unfortunately, it does not have in uh, like a notification or anything letting us know when they sign their return. So we have to go back and manually look at that. So um, once they sign their return, then we'll we'll go through with the stage and let them know if it has been accepted or if it has been rejected. Now, this is something that, of course, like I said, that has to have human intervention. These systems does not work together uh, per se, but it does work the, along with our process. So if it's accepted when the compliance person goes through, because that's the person in my process that does it is the um, compliance person, they're checking for those signatures because mind you, we can't transmit the return until we get the signature. So once that, that's usually the last process, the last step before we transmit the return. So once it's transmitted and once they get accepted, then boom, the compliance person now has their duty to grab that baton, grab the um, return and slide it over to either the accepted column or the denial column. Now, of course, y'all know we can't customize it to where um, every time somebody gets denied, we can tell them exactly what the denial is for. We can't do that, but we can send them a general email to let them know like, hey, your return has been denied. Here's one of the most common reasons. Somebody will reach out to you to let you know. And um, that's either through the text message, that's either through um, maybe we give them a quick call real quick because some stuff can be fixed real quickly like that. If it's something that may be, you know, let's just say for instance, is a dependent has already been filed. That's a situation that's going to need a phone call. So uh, we all have to, you know, tell them, hey, this is something that may need a phone call. We'll be giving you a call pretty soon. So things of that nature. Now, after it's been accepted, it's gonna, they're going to get a text message um, letting them know it's been accepted. They'll get an email letting them know. Hey, here's where you will check your, here's how to check the status of your return, what that means for you. Cause the country, like we still have to let 
people know, we can't assume that they know that accepted return, you know, what that means. Some people think like, hey, it's coming real soon in the next couple of days. And they not be, that is not the case. Everybody don't know about the path tax. So we still have to um, educate everybody as if they do not know. Now, uh, after the return has been accepted, we wait for one day and request a referral. So, yep, I'm going to hit you with a referral real quick, real quick. I need to know, can you go ahead and send me some more clients? And during that time, um, we were doing like the on-the-spot referral. So people were sending folks left and right. So that's the, uh, I don't know if I'm going to do that again this year, but um, yeah, we requested a referral and um, we waited until February 15th and sent them out the PATH Act message, letting them know the PATH Act has been lifted. Um, your return should go back into normal processing. You should be receiving a, a funding date pretty soon. And that's that. Now, if they are funded, so I use Refund Advantage. So Refund Advantage lets you know on Friday night, pretty much that's like the big drop. They know who, or, um, when the IRS sends them a notification of who's going to get funded, we'll know that on Friday night. So um, I'll go ahead and go on there. I'm very excited. I don't got no time. I'm, I, I, don't, like, I don't care. I don't have nothing else to worry about during that time. So each one of them, I'm letting them know, hey, your money is on the way. Because I'm happy too. My birthday um, usually be around the big drop. So I'm happy. I'm on there drinking my wine and I'm letting everybody know. And they happy too. So it's a happy day during that time. And after that, that's the email that they get. The return, your refund is on the way. And after seven days, I asked them uh, for a review. Go in there, leave me a Google review because that really, you know, helps us out. And um, you can also leave a review on our website and on Facebook. For every review that you give us, that's one more drawing into our big giveaway at the end of the year. And I use Gleam.io to track that. So you can go to um, G-L-E-A-M.io and you can run giveaways to where Anytime you do a giveaway, you can tell them, okay, if you share this post, that's one point or that's one extra entry. If you give us a Google review, that's five extra entries or however you want to do it. But Gleam, I, oh, it's not free, but it's definitely worth it, especially if you are going to be doing like comment giveaways. It will link with your Facebook page or your Instagram page and it will automatically pull the comments out. So you don't have to worry about like, you know, uh, writing all this stuff, putting them on like a wheel. If you want to, it can automatically be done through Gleam.io. Oh my God, y'all did not see the questions. I'm sorry. Let me go back up real quick. That was a lot, but I hope y'all um got that. Let me see. Cognito Farms is hard for you to build out. Uh, I, a job form is hard for me to build, uh, build out. Shakara make that stuff look so easy. And I just be like, girl, I can't, I can't get it. Will you explain, including the engagement letter on the intake form? So we, it just depends on which one you want to use. So if you wanted to build out an engagement letter on here, all you would have to do is, where is the plus sign? All you have to do is like go on here and put, let's say, a plus and you can build the, I think it's called, let's do content. I think that's what it is. Yep, and you will just put it in here so you can build out like engagement letter and then let's just say this your letter and then you can have a spot for the signature. So that's the way you can build it out right then and there. Okay. Oh, my bad. I wish I had to scroll. <laughs> I should have scrolled down a little bit more. Y'all had already answered it. Thank you, Jasmine. Y'all so helpful. Shoot. Because it's been a long day, y'all. I was basically doing this thing with my eyes closed. How do you get a signature for a virtual client? Just like she said, through your software, that's the best option. If you use Cognito Form. You can do signatures, tax down. Oh yeah, um, you'll have to, in tax layer, you'll have to use either that client portal or the mobile app. Yep, the app is gleam, G-L-E-A-M dot I-O. 
So that's my process, y'all. That's what usually, um, you know, it worked for me last year. Now let me show you real quick what I meant about like my pipeline and we can get up off of here for today. I hope y'all had, um, you know, learned a lot today. Let me see. So this is that tax prep process. Now each one of these tabs is as the clients are coming in, as soon as they submit the form on Cognito, the intake form, they will pop up here, okay? It's gonna be right there on the intake form submitted. So as we're working, um, once, let me see if I can go back to, is anybody in here? Let me see. Dang, it's not. So uh, once you have a square on here, let me see if I can do one real quick. put my email here we go and what i do right here y'all and i'm gonna tell y'all this really helps me out a whole whole lot this year it really showed me some really good like analytics and uh how much money i made how much money i gave out of discounts how much money I, um, you know, kind of lost as well because if somebody started that process and they did not file with me um, based upon like whatever, let's just say for instance, they uploaded their tax documents, right? And I saw that by them having just a simple W-2, what I would have charged them or if they filed a business, what I would have charged them, right? So I know exactly how much money I kind of lost as well. So I can use that to um, know how to improve in the future. So right here where you could put the deal value, you can put, let's just say this client is worth 350. So when I win that client, you know, um, that'll be money that I actually made. If I lost that client, then that'll be money that I lost. So as they're coming in, and once I get, you know, through with the return and I saw how much I charged them, including like the e-file fees and all of that, then I'll enter that information on there. So that'll be something that I do, um, you know, go back in there and do. And I sometimes I tend to do that like at the end of the season, if I, you know, when things kind of slow down and I can go in there and plug exactly how much. And a cool feature of that is to it builds up over time. So if you got like repeating clients, no matter like if you have a um, client that came back another season, um, you can, this will be a new deal. So you can see exactly how much money you have made from them from um, a lifetime, how much money you have made from them, how much, um, you know, money you have maybe lost from them. If you have other websites, you can integrate them on this thing as well, because I run um, the tax prep website through here as well. Like the stuff that I do for tax professionals, I run it on here too. So um, as you can see, this is a process that I was telling you about. So when, when we're actually through the season, that page that I just showed you, we don't go there. That is how you just build your process. This is the page that I have glued to my computer uh, throughout the tax season. So this is where when I get up in the morning, this is the first thing that I go to. So um, this is where like in this section, nobody really, you know, has to do anything here other than just see who's there. Now, this part right here is for my assistant, and I got two this year that's doing that, you know, starting the process of initiating the returns. So once they go in and they put in the information, then they're just going to slide this person right on over there. They have sent them their portal. All of their information is already in there. The only thing is the next step is for me to do what I need to do. Now, if I look at it and I say, okay, we need some more documents from them. This is not enough. I'll move that there. If it's not, you know, if there's, um, hopefully I got everything I need and I have done the return. The only thing that I need is for um, the return to be completed in the signature. I'll move it there. Usually most people will go there anyway. I don't really need a whole lot of documents uh, from folks because of their return, the um, cognito form that I have. Now, once the return is accepted, we just moved along. So it will go among this pipeline. Now, if we the return is rejected, we'll move them over here. And once we move them over there, it is going to initiate, we have a rejection pipeline because um, that's a whole nother process that has you know more steps in, included. So they'll get an email letting them know that the return has been rejected. And actually I'm getting emails right now from when I moved it over. So let me see if I can pull this up for y'all. And just to say, I'll do it in just a second, but. 
um, it's more, every time I send something, it's sending um, emails to my personal email. Now, this is like I said, when they get funded, we move them there. Now, so let's say for instance, we're at the end of the season and um, I got that client, it's funded, and I, I'll just drag it there and it's won. If it's lost, like if they stop responding, if they don't ghost me, if they say, look, I went somewhere else, I went to TurboTax, I'll just pop them there. And automatically, um, if they do not respond, if they do not open one of my emails for 14 days, it will automatically move them to the um, the side, the, the lost side. I don't know why I'm getting so tongue tied. So you can go in here, you can look and see all of the clients. You can see where any of the files. So like I told y'all, how my system works together. So instead of me having to give my um, VA or um, the compliance person, instead of me having to give them access to this, um, once they submit that Cognito form, it will automatically bring the files, all of the files that they uploaded, all of the, um, the actual form that they completed, it will bring it here in this file section in a zip file. So that's another way for me to keep this stuff in more than one location and I can also have you know a backup document whenever I need it so let's just say for instance I lose my cognito I lose access to my cognito form at least I will have all of the information here and vice versa so um anytime that you have like a tech because I didn't go on here and build a task yet so you can create tasks there as well. So um, if you need to do a follow-up phone call, if you need to do a, um, let's just say a, a screen share with them, if this is one of the clients that wants you to go through the return, if you have to validate their identity. So if this is a new client and you're kind of skeptical or whatever, and you want to hop on FaceTime or something with them, you can create a task there. And this will integrate with your um, any type of emails that you use, like this integrates with my Zoho. And I found that link as well for y'all for the um, Zoho. Let me go, see, let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. It's a, um, the five, up to five emails. So all you have to do is click this link and it'll take you directly to the direct sign up page. So if you sign up there, you can get up to five free professional email addresses. All right. So I am tongue tied, y'all. I'm I'm just about tired now. <laughs> All right, y'all. Anybody have any questions? Let me hop up off this real quick, and because it's nine thirty, let me cut my sound up. They were asking if the recordings of this challenge will be made available, or you know, or it's either you show up or you don't. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is ma on my um YouTube. That's the only place I can just know that I don't have to send them out individually or worry about any um you know data limits or time limits and stuff. So it's on my YouTube. If you go to the link tree, everything is on that link tree, y'all. So anything that we talk about, like if I tell y'all, okay, this is where I go to get this. This is where I go to get that. I'm gonna post it on this link tree. So any links that we talk about, any replays any freebies or whatever is going to be on this link so this list might get a little long but if you just scroll down it you'll get everything that you need for um anything we go over these next two weeks yep this is active campaign but we're going to show y'all two more and um hopefully you guys can you know make a determination off of that one Tax Dome is a, um, one of the ones that a lot of people use. I've seen it getting a little bit more, um, you know, complex or whatever with its features. Hopefully, if one day we'll have a CRM that completely integrates with the tax software and that will come already ready to go because building stuff is kind of, you know, it takes a little time. But the best thing is just being prepared. You know, when, if you know you want to have a completely automated office after the tax season during the summer, that is what you have to focus on. Like go ahead and build that stuff out during the summer so that when October and November hit, you have a smooth sailing season. You won't have to be scuffling and struggling to try to figure out what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do, or end up with a process that you really may not want because you know you didn't have one together so summertime is the great a great time to work on automations and workflows and each year you still need to tweak them to update to tax laws 
you want to have it fresh, you know, uh, give it like a little face splash, change some stuff, um, keep up with the inflation rates, change your pricing, stuff like that. Any questions? Any more questions before we get off? Tax Dom said they're working on adding text messages. If they do, that would be awesome because I see a lot of people kind of um, asking for that feature. One day, hopefully, the, the software will do something like this, shoe because Devin Shaw was trying to build one. He did Ninja for credit repair. He has a Facebook group. Who is Devin Shaw? I don't think I know him. But he's um, a, um Devin Shaw is a um a autom like he does automations and so he built a system called Ninja that a lot of people use in credit repair now that's kind of um comparable to CRC but it, a lot of people say it's better because the automations of sending out the text messages the 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 marketing funnels is all automated inside that software including pulling the credit repair reports. Um, but so he's working with this um, chick who does automations named Ruth, who did it for some tax preparers. And so they're looking for beta testers from uh, tax preparers um, to tell them what they need in the software, because he's trying to build the ultimate tax software based on what we ask for and not what other companies think we want. That makes sense. I hope so. I hope they do it because I'm telling you, that would be a complete um game changer because it seems as if like they just assume what we would like and I really think that they need one for you know that kind of integrates with the bank products now one thing I can say um uh, refundo they actually have a seat like a CRM that works directly with the bank product so it's like um it, it kind of di indirectly works with the software too because once the return is accepted it will automatically send it. So I think that's kind of cool or whatever. But unfortunately, you have to you have to use Refundo to do that. But um, that is for the ones that do use Refundo, that may be something for you know you guys to look at. But we're gonna be doing one more um walkthrough on some well, two more walkthroughs on tomorrow. We're gonna be going over one that has a lifetime pass where you pay one time and that's it. And it does pretty much everything. We briefly went over it yesterday, but um, I cannot wait to show that to y'all tomorrow. And uh, we'll also be going over the job form and how um, to use job form to your advantage. And of course, job form is one of the free ones. Well, you can start off free, but once you do like a certain amount of forms, you will have to pay for it. But you just for the tax prep process. Some people are running this for absolutely free. And then um, Friday, I mean, Thursday, uh, we'll be going over SOPs. And on Friday, we'll we be going over due diligence. And we also have a, um, a guest speaker for that day, Gary Cole. He's going to be coming in and doing a due diligence session. And next week, I'm going to post all of the speakers and stuff for next week on Friday. Okay, so good night, everybody. If y'all don't have any other questions. <clears throat> I will see y'all tomorrow, same time, 7 p.m. Now, don't forget, next week, the classes are at 5 p.m. for the challenge, okay? Um, I have a tax class that's um, going to be Monday through Friday. It's 16 p.e. So um, those are going to be at 7 p.m. So I'm going to be on here from 5 till about probably 10 every day next week, but I wouldn't change it for the world. So good night, everybody, and I will see y'all tomorrow.